It's December, it's The Simpsons, it's time for some holiday specials. The Simpsons have done so many of these over the years, so let's rank these things. Here are your 20 Simpsons Christmas episodes, seasons 1 through 32. Something's gotta land at the bottom, I'm going with this anthology episode from season 17. First up, we have a fairly paint-by-numbers segment about the first Christmas, with some heavily telegraphed jokes and plot points. Casting Marge and Homer as Mary and Joseph is a fun idea conceptually, some nice jokes about Marge's virgin birth and Homer's bad parenting. Bart as baby Jesus is a weird fit, but there's funny pranks here. The World War II segment I mostly enjoy for the Grandpa and Mr. Burns stuff, them fighting while stuck on that island. I also like the idea of Grandpa telling this implausible story of shooting down Santa and having a reindeer dogfight. But this ending where Santa shows up and takes Grandpa to his brother is extraordinarily stupid, even for an anthology. The third segment is probably my favorite, has that 22 short films about Springfield vibe as we bounce around. I could have done without an entire song about Moe's suicide attempts, but this Homer and Marge ending is very sweet. Overall, Simpsons Christmas Stories isn't a disaster or anything, it's just a combination of some baffling choices and obvious jokes. If this is the worst Christmas episode, that's not too bad, all things considered. We're doing it again! Back-to-back -back anthology episodes! Ready, set, go! Segment number one, The Polar Express Adventure. This is probably my favorite here, as there's some memorable jokes, like the trippy pot sequence, the labor problems with the elves, crusty as trickster Santa Claus. Not the most original take on the North Pole ever, but it's fun and the characters fit into their roles. Next, we have yet another World War II segment. This one's pretty fun, seeing all of our favorite characters in this time period. I like the twist of Marge going off to war, then doing Inglorious Bastards. The central conceit of Lisa hating Christmas trees is super bizarre though. I don't get why they went for this storyline. The Martha Stewart fantasy is generally fine. I agree with SNL that Martha Stewart's kinda hilarious, with her dry and oddly sinister delivery. The whole thing is a mix of super obvious jokes and demented behavior. And the final segment, with the Muppet parody, is a mixed bag. I love the Muppets, and the Simpsons nail the sort of cheesy vaudeville feel of these guys. Unfortunately, I don't think the Katy Perry part works, even in the context of a hackneyed Muppet cameo. She's given weak material and never looks that comfortable interacting with them. Although it is nice to see Mo not trying to off himself for a change. The Nightmare After Christmas has some interesting ideas, but feels like a wasted opportunity. Krusty's been in plenty of Christmas specials over the years, having him star in a holiday special would be a chance to finally do something for Hanukkah. In this episode, Krusty converts to Christianity because his famously Christian daughter Sophie, now voiced by Natasha Lyonne, is disappointed in him. Yeah, it's a weird premise. There's some good Reverend Lovejoy material here, with him desperately trying to recruit him. There's even some patented Krusty Christmas cynicism in Act 1, very much in character for him. But the Sophie angle falls flat. Her Christianity feels arbitrary, her relationship with Krusty is shallow, and we don't get much of her POV. And then they bring back Rabbi Krustovsky as Olaf in a Frozen parody, and it's just like, what are we doing here? The episode probably would have been even lower if it weren't for this amazing Gnome in the Home B-plot. I love how creepy they make this thing for Maggie, how oblivious Marge is, how Maggie gets her revenge in the end. 
Maggie surprisingly doesn't get much attention in these holiday specials, and after she carried this B-plot so well, I'd love to see her get another one. Dude, Where's My Ranch is barely a holiday episode. It's really just the beginning, up until Homer writes his Everybody Hates Ned Flanders song. Even still, as brief as the Christmas stuff is, there's some good stuff here. Then the Flanders song itself is pretty darn memorable too, even if the FLA and RDS chorus breaks my brain. The Dude Ranch main storyline is kind of whatever for me. They get some mileage out of the Wild West tropes and City Slicker stuff, love this Bart joke right here. It is kind of odd how uninterested in riding horses Lisa is. The riders were leaning into her environmentalism super hard at this time. JTT does a charming enough job in his guest role. He and Lisa have good chemistry together. The whole jealousy plot with jerk-ass Lisa sabotaging Clara doesn't quite succeed as an Act 3 complication. Funny joke about Lisa basically committing attempted murder, but it's overall a pretty simplistic story arc. With the jealousy traps and misunderstandings, this feels more like an episode of a kid's show, to be honest. The whole thing is worth it, though, for the screw the audience resolution, so I shouldn't judge it too harshly. Also, Homer has a subplot about fighting beavers or something. You know what's great about Tis the 30th season? How supportive the family is of Marge. She takes quite a beating during Act 1, camping out all night for Black Friday, fighting the crowds, and walking away with nothing but frostbitten hands. Gil is the worst, by the way. But afterwards, there's Homer trying to find a way to cheer her up, surprise her with a fun Florida vacation. Then, when they find out their vacation sucks, the kids and Homer keep trying to pretend they're having a great time. There's so many observational jokes about crappy vacations, from garbage hotels to substandard parks and attractions. I think a lot of people can relate to the mentality of, this sucks, but might be a funny story someday. I do wish the episode had a stronger resolution, however. Their fight with this motel lady doesn't go anywhere interesting, and once Marge admits that she's not having a good time, everyone's just kinda, yeah, okay, we all hate it too. Let's do a happy ending at Moe's instead. It's the very definition of a story fizzling out. However, if you don't necessarily mind a very aimless Christmas, Tis the 30th season is the episode for you. Finally, old Gil gets his moment in the sun, and a Christmas episode to boot. Kinda. I think Kill Gil Volumes 1 and 2 starts out exceptionally strong. We get an entertaining opening set piece with Krusty's Ice Show, which also kicks off Homer's rivalry with the Grumple. Then it's off to Costington's for some shopping jokes and Gil making Lisa's Christmas a little brighter. They do an excellent job making Gil seem likable at first, putting us in the Simpson family's shoes and then having him grate on their nerves over the following acts. The downside is that this results in Gil grating on the audience's nerves too. Act 2 can be a bit repetitive as they go through the years with all these Gil annoyances. Still, I think transforming this into a Marge conflict was a super smart idea. Marge is the type who would take pity on Gil, who would have trouble saying no to him. We can sympathize and follow along with Marge's frustrations, culminating in an odd trip to Scottsdale, Arizona of all places. I don't feel like this ending totally works, but it does bookend the whole story and makes me feel kinda good about how everything turned out. The only question now is what is really going on with the Grumple? Seriously, Homer is right to wonder about this. These Holiday Simpsons episodes can often be emotionally draining or contain these big adventure plots, so it's nice to have a more relaxed hangout example like White Christmas Blues. This one gives the family relationships a break, instead telling a story of Marge trying to run a bed and breakfast. There's tons of cute little character moments for Homer and Bart, as they try to fulfill various roles and rack up some tips. Also, shout out to Homer's baby Jesus fantasy. What a champ. Homer in general is pretty adorable throughout this one. The main conflict of the story revolves around the guests' annoying demands and Marge desperately trying to keep up with them. Lots of relatable humor about entertaining guests. We're usually supposed to sympathize with put upon Marge, but in this one, since she started the business, it's like, what did she expect? It's not always clear if the guests are overly annoying or if Marge created an unmanageable situation. It's probably meant to be a little of both. Between this and Lisa's present buying B-plot, 
White Christmas Blues isn't exactly the most likable holiday episode for the Simpsons ladies. That being said, the stakes are never particularly high, and the characters exhibit enough self-reflection and grace to provide a happy ending that feels earned. It's not complicated, but it feels good. Manger Things is probably the most disappointing episode on this list, because they were so close to a holiday classic. They just fumbled the ball on some of the character stuff. I like the idea of a Christmas flashback with the Flanders family. Homer has had his ups and downs with them, that these holiday themes mesh perfectly with their relationship. It's a good opportunity for some pissy mod, as this extremely pregnant woman has to deal with this stupid oaf being in her house. In addition, there's some genuinely compelling lore in this episode. We learn about the secret room above the garage and discover that Todd Flanders' middle name is Homer. Aw, I like that. Unfortunately, the Marge angle of the story is extremely poorly done, in that Homer never does anything wrong to get kicked out of the house, Lenny and Carl end up spiking his drink. It's a misunderstanding plot, but the story in its ending treats it as a Homer atonement story, constantly sending him through the ringer. Also, having your ending depend on an emotional scene between Homer and Maude is a choice. If you can block out some of their context, this is an incredibly heartwarming moment. And even if you can't, there's still plenty of nostalgic warm fuzzies and some engaging Homer Flanders action that makes Manger Things worth your time. I feel so conflicted about Miracle and Evergreen Terrace. This was from all the way back in Season 9. How could this not even crack the top 10? I mean, there are so many iconic jokes here. Bloody spearheads for Bart, Lisa's yellow sweater, Bart's dream, the family cross-country skiing, Moe's donation, Patches and poor Violet, the news report, Marge going on Jeopardy. I mean, come on, this thing's got Alex Trebek. Everybody loves Alex Trebek. I think the episode does a great job subverting the typical treacly holiday story arcs. It knows exactly where the story should be going and always sends the Simpsons in a darker, more cynical direction. That reveal that everyone's stealing all their stuff gets me every single time. The thing is, I don't think Miracle in Evergreen Terrace is that fun. It's too bleak for its own good. It understands that Christmas episodes need to hit low lows, really gut punch the audience with sad moments. I feel like they went a little overboard here, falling somewhere in the my sister, my sitter tier of misery. As cheap as it is though, the ending still does kind of get me, with that song and the family playfully chasing each other. Between this and the solid jokes from season 9, Miracle and Evergreen Terrace should still somehow give the audience something to smile about. I always think of Tis the 15th Season as the pop culture Christmas episode in that a lot of its most memorable moments are related to some homage or something they're watching on TV. The California Prunes, the Rankin Bass parody, Mr. McGrew, the Grinch Who Stole Christmas stuff in Act 3. I really like the idea of, instead of actually doing a tired Christmas Carol parody, that instead Homer learns a lesson from watching TV. Very in character for him. Gotta say, this episode's got a really weird plot. It starts out normal enough, how Homer's selfishness is well established with the astrolabe, giving the story somewhere to go, but then they basically revolve that arc early in Act 2, and the episode turns into Homer Loves Flanders of all things. And then for some reason, Homer switches to stealing everyone's presents in the end. It's pretty bizarre. These individual plot ideas work independently, especially bringing Flanders into the story. Combining them all into one storyline, especially with this ending, is a bit on the incoherent side of things. I will say that of all the group song endings in these holiday specials, this is one of the best. We get the traditional Springfield mob and the traditional Simpsons closing song. What could be better? Grift of the Magi is easily the most densely plotted episode on this list. God, there's so much that happens in this thing. Bart breaking his coccyx, the school in debt to the mob, begging Mr. Burns, the corporations taking over, and then finally all this funzo intrigue. They definitely could have gotten to this stuff quicker, but even still, all these Act 1 plot elements do their job and provide some solid laughs. This Mr. Burns scene in particular is underrated. 
I feel like it hits its groove in Act 2, when the kids are starting to piece everything together, confront the executives, and learn more about Funzo, then teaming up with Homer to save the day. Man, I forgot how many of these Act 3s involve stealing presents. The ending is definitely on the gimmicky side. I'm guessing the writers didn't want to do some kind of Terminator-esque showdown with the robots, so they went for a meta argument with Gary Coleman. I do like this ending around the dinner table, though. In such a densely plotted adventure like Grift of the Magi, it's nice to slow down and enjoy this kinda sorta happy ending. She of Little Faith is like the opposite of Dude Where's My Ranch, where this time, the Christmas stuff sneaks up on us. Now it takes a while for Lisa's Buddhism plot to kick in, but all the preamble stuff works. Let's watch Homer explode himself repeatedly with rockets. Now let's do an extremely melodramatic NASA send-up with Nibbles the Hamster. Now let's explode the church. Oops. Pairing up Mr. Burns with the Rev provides some fun commentary about the intersection of business and religion, and allows Burns to be his petty, manipulative self. It's a good outlet for Lisa Outrage too, as yeah, they went too far with this stuff. I do kind of wish we got a more introspective look at Lisa's search for faith. Richard Gere lays out the character reasons why she'd be drawn to Buddhism, but Lisa doesn't really express what it means to her in a substantial way. They instead make room for a Marge-Lisa conflict, similar to Lisa the Skeptic. I think the Marge dynamic works great, all these little tricks trying to get Lisa back on Team Christmas. I love how she literally bakes cookies and throws them away. The conflict is pretty simplistic, doesn't have a lot of time to devote to it, but it does touch on something real between people and they get a sweet ending out of it. In a very consumerism-driven genre of Simpsons episodes, I love that we have a more philosophical example like this one. I Won't Be Home For Christmas is one of the drier episodes on this list, isn't full of big dynamic set pieces and outlandish laugh out loud moments. Its plot is extremely simple, just a misunderstanding story where Marge kicks Homer out, Homer wanders alone, and Marge and the kids go look for him. But I would contend that it's full of small character moments that make it worthwhile. Like Homer keeping Moe company for a couple of hours, which kicks off the whole misunderstanding. Then later, Homer coming across Flanders closing up shop at a deserted outdoor mall, offering to buy something from him. This episode really gets at the sense of loneliness that people can feel around the holiday season, has a sense of atmosphere that is unmatched by most Simpsons holiday specials. I like how this bored mall employee, just trying to close for the night, invites Homer to this party. It's nice. This episode is full of these small kindnesses that make the characters' nights slightly more bearable. I do wish Marge's search for Homer had a bit more substance to it, as it takes a little too long to get going, and the ending doesn't punch hard enough emotionally. But even despite those flaws, I Won't Be Home For Christmas has its heart in the right place and a strong sense of its character relationships. They nailed its themes, and that's the most important thing. We get a holiday adventure and a sideshow Bob mystery. What's not to love? I really appreciate the variety that Bobby It's Cold Outside provides. That it sets up this little mystery of this unmarked van going around stealing presents, even raising the stakes when Lenny blew himself. It's not the deepest mystery or anything, but there's intrigue, pushing the story towards Sideshow Bob's specialty. In addition, using this holiday theme park as a setting was a wonderful decision. It's nice to get the family on a mini road trip away, exploring a new setting and doing some theme park jokes. Also, huge props for a Gnome in the Home callback for Maggie. Good stuff. I will warn you, there's a baby shark joke in this episode, but I would contend it's pretty charming and well done. A real baby shark Christmas miracle. The solution to the mystery is a bit on the lame side, but the reveal is told in a funny way, and it does lead to some compelling Mr. Burns character development. I like that Sideshow Bob gets to walk Burns through his issues, delivering a Christmas moral that Kelsey Grammer would get behind. The only thing I don't like about this episode is the Steve Ballmer ending, which is incredibly, incredibly annoying. My advice, just turn it off after this song. Okay, so I've been talking about this episode a lot lately, so I'm going to try to avoid repeating myself too much. 
Skinner's sense of snow is delightful. It's the perfect example of how The Simpsons can simply throw dynamic characters together and create magic. We get Homer and Flanders stuck in the car. We get the kids and Principal Skinner. We get some Skinner trying to slap his willy around. There is barely any plot. It has the confidence that the characters can carry the day. I like watching Homer and Flanders bicker about the snowplow, the car engine fumes, running themselves into a salt silo. Skinner reaches new heights of squareness with this lame DVD and his hard-ass military turn. Then seeing the tables turned and being reduced to this in the second half. I kind of admire the writer's restraint for not going further with this stuff. Like the kids torment Skinner and get into their permanent records, but it's not like they're burning down the school or putting Skinner in any real danger. That being said, even I have my limit for character-driven stories, so I wish a little more actually happens in a Skinner's sense of snow. Maybe one or two more substantial plot beats. Even still, in a very zany era of the show, it's nice having a more leisurely episode like this, just content to relax, see a show, and enjoy some exhaust-related hallucinations. Ha. All right, a Springfield summer Christmas for Christmas isn't going to be for everyone. This is an extremely earnest parody of Hallmark Christmas movies, right down to the music cues, plotting, and character arcs. It's one of the least Simpson-y episodes of The Simpsons ever. But this thing has won me over. I've seen a couple of these Hallmark movies before, and The Simpsons absolutely nailed the vibe. Ellie Kemper perfectly portrays the protagonist. Her disdain for the small town, her irrational like of Christmas, her love-hate relationship with Skinner. Using Skinner as the romantic interest is a genius choice. He has that small town cornball energy that suits the story. Honestly, this episode is surprisingly well plotted, with the Simpson family storylines ending up intersecting with the main story. I especially love Marge in this, who seems self-aware that she's in a Heartmark movie and is loving every second of it. Marge's enthusiasm is kind of infectious. Also, special shout out to Richard Kind, who should probably be in every animated everything, because he is awesome here. Sometimes when watching this episode, I do wonder if The Simpsons went too far down the parody rabbit hole and they accidentally did make a tedious and formulaic episode. Maybe that's true. But I say, give me more tediousness if it's going to set up an ending this hilarious. It's totally worth it. Man, The Way of the Dog is so dang good. There's a reason people went nuts for this episode a couple years back. I think there's something about the holidays that makes us nostalgic, where we want to look back on years past and where we came from. So The Simpsons doing this Santa's Little Helper story feels good, goes all the way back to the first episode, and even beyond that, to learn more about an otherwise neglected character on the show. The mystery aspect is built up quite cleverly, first getting these quick flashes of imagery, then revealing more and more bits of info as we go along. This is a challenging story to pull off, trying to get that dog POV, and they absolutely crush it. The story is certainly on the heavier side of things, especially with the stakes in Act 2, but the payoff is well worth the drama. And there's still plenty of hilarious jokes with the Simpson family. Homer is, once again, hitting peak cuteness. Kate Blanchett does a wonderful job playing the dog psychologist character, her voice bringing a sense of maturity and depth to a concept that would otherwise be extremely silly. She has to carry all these scenes with Santa's little helper, and it never feels awkward. Really, the only thing I don't like about the way of the dog is the stuff with her fiancé, as this guy is pretty boring. But even he provides texture to the story. And last but not least, the ending moment is a thing of beauty. I'm not even going to spoil it. If you've never seen this episode, go track it down. I feel like, more than any other Flash Forward episode, Holidays of Future Past has the best sense of what the audience wants to see with this glimpse into the future. Of course, we get so many technology jokes showing off how the world of Springfield had changed and the wacky, old-fashioned, anachronistic stuff. But most importantly, we get a real look at how things shook out for Bart, Lisa, and Maggie. No offense to Lisa's wedding, but I like how this one hit upon the adult relationships. Lisa and Marge, Homer and Bart, and even Bart and Lisa getting drunk in the treehouse together. Despite all the wacky technology and unfamiliar setting, there's a cyclical nature to the relationships that are easy to follow. 
Now Bart's having trouble connecting to the kids, while Grandpa Homer is the best. Now Lisa is the out-of-touch Marge in her daughter's life. I wish we, the audience, knew more about Zia as a character so that this ending hits harder, but this whole internet adventure in general is great. And having pregnant Maggie as the side story succeeds as a change of pace and a heartwarming way to conclude things. Unfortunately, the sequel to this episode isn't any good, but its existence demonstrates what a compelling world they created in Holidays of Future Past. Wonderful character dynamics that left the audience wanting more. Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire is a classic. We all know this one by heart, y'all don't need me telling you why this thing is cool. I admit, I struggle with the rating for this spot, as this rough season 1 example had to compete with polished modern classics like the previous two entries. But that season 1 rawness is why it has aged so well as a holiday classic. There's a rawness to the characterizations, that everyone is acting like themselves, but with very little pretense or gimmick. Patty and Selma aren't doing wordplay jokes or screw the audience stuff, it's just, can I please speak to Marge, or hey, what is that birdhouse? In addition, I just enjoy this super likable, hardworking version of Homer we get here. This guy who loves Christmas so much and doesn't want to disappoint his family, wants to do the very best he can for them. Yeah, it's an extremely, extremely simple and formulaic story concept, but Homer as a character has gone through a lot over the years. From Captain Wacky, to Jerkass Homer, to being written like a giant dog. He's so flawed and earnest, he's like the perfect holiday protagonist. It's a story in which Homer can fail repeatedly, never understand what he's doing all the way up to the end, and still bungle his way into a happy ending. The episode is super duper earnest, but still has some of that chaotic, messy Simpsons energy. And yeah, maybe putting this all the way at number two is just a nostalgia pick, but screw it. It's Christmas time, so give me some nostalgia. This was never a competition for me. Marge Be Not Proud was always going to top this list. It's one of the best Simpsons episodes ever, in my opinion. More than anything, I think this is an episode that really remembers what it was like being a kid. How excited you were for the cool new thing. How much you fixate on it and try every possible avenue to get it. That Bart thinks he could stand around looking sad, thinking someone might buy him a copy. The jokes aren't just making fun of childishness, it understands that perspective. I think that applies to how it handles his relationship with Marge. How sensitive he is to disappointing his mom. How he observes those subtle changes in her behavior toward him. I mean, it's just hot cocoa marshmallows, but when you're young, these little changes can get to you. The episode is famous for how schmaltzy it is, and you all know I love that emotionality and stuff. Aww, look at that ending. But Marge Being Up Proud is a sneaky funny episode too. I mean, my god, this is the Don Brodka episode. Thrill Ho, Gavin and his mom, Lee Carvalho's putting challenge. You know you have a funny episode when a Troy McClure video is a relative footnote. I suppose it's not the most consistently gag-driven episode ever, but when the jokes hit, they hit hard. Honestly, I could talk for several more minutes about what a masterpiece Marge Be Not Proud is, but I'm going to leave it here for now. This thing is classic Simpsons. Strong jokes, wonderful character writing, and brings a tear to my eye. Thanks, Mike. So that wraps up my holiday list. Let me know in the comments how you would rank these Simpsons Christmas episodes. Which are your favorites? Which of these modern specials are underrated? Do any of them make you feel like a Grinch, a Scrooge, or whatever the hell a Grumple is? Let me know if you figure it out. Hope everyone's having a nice holiday season. Thanks for watching.